spheres of justice. choose to be in your class. Um, the title of today's class is How to Win Debates in Political Theory Against Politics Students. And that's not actually as hard as it sounds, because most politics students know very, very little about politics. Um, and you can learn a lot more about politics and political theory actually through studying other areas, um, economics for one, law for another you tend to overlap a lot with political ideas in those spheres. Um, also, if you study philosophy generally, all politics is rooted at some level in philosophy. So what we're going to discuss, and this is in no way comprehensive, obviously it's impossible to instruct you in less than an hour in the finer points of political theory through the ages. But what I hope to do is spark enough enthusiasm that you are willing to go away and learn more about various constructs for yourself so that you become more aware of the similarities, the tensions, the potential flaws that any political system has if we take it to a logical conclusion. So we're going to talk first of all about paradigms within political theory. We are then going to talk about internal constructs within those paradigms and how those themselves might be contradictory. So you can have very conflicting views, for example, of Marxism, depending on which construct of Marx you choose to adhere to. We're then going to have a little bit of a chat about the purpose of politics and political theory. Then we're going to look at whether older distinctions that perhaps were valid in earlier times about political theory, such as concepts of left-wing and right-wing, whether those are still as relevant today as they always have been, or whether we need to find a new vocabulary of um, distinction. And then we're going to hopefully have time for a couple of questions about how we then move ideas forward in the political spectrum. So let's go back then to this first idea of paradigms. What do we mean when we talk about a paradigm in political theory? What does the word paradigm mean? Let's start there. Absolutely, absolutely. That's a pretty good characterization of it, a dominant mode of thinking. If we, for example, mention an ex something is a paradigm example, it is the example. It is the one example that illustrates better than any other. Similarly, with paradigms of theory, there are certain ideas that hold sway because they are more complete, they are more coherent, they are more internally logical and therefore they stand the test of time. There have been lots of ideas in politics, some of which we've rejected almost completely. And within those, we can talk about constructs like um, theocracy, oligarchy, plutocracy, meritocracy, all of which might need to be mentioned at some point. But very rarely in the modern political spectrum do we deal with any of those, possibly with theocracies in certain parts of the world. Can anybody name me a theocracy paradigm as an example? Where is the paradigm for a theocratic state right now? Iran. Iran, absolutely. The Guardian Council of Mullahs, the Ayatollah, have ultimate control even over the democratic process, to the extent that reformist MPs in Iran have to get the approval of the Guardian Council of Mullahs before they're allowed to stand for election. That seems quite odd, that you could have a different form of political theory governing a subform. But well, we'll talk about that when we talk about internal constructs. So what then do we think are the paradigms of dominant political theory today? Democracy. Democracy. Certainly in the West, there is a heterodoxy <coughs> of thought about democracy. Western liberal democracy is good for us, therefore it is good for everybody. Let us export it and force people at gunpoint to be free. Obviously, there's no logical flaw in that statement, is there, forcing people at gunpoint to be free? What other paradigms are there? Let's think of the 20th century particularly, because that was a really good time if you wanted to experiment with political ideas. Sorry? Nationalism. 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 
Nationalism is not necessarily a political theory in and of itself. It's one that lends it to several other political theories, particularly though fascism as a political theory. But the fascist ideal has existed a lot longer than just the 1920s. The fascist ideal finds its roots in the militarist societies of the ancient world. The Spartans were essentially a fascist nation. And whilst that might seem somewhat crazy to us, if anybody's seen the 300, they did a damn good job against those Persians, didn't they? <laughs> and what else? Earlier than the 20th century, rule of law. Rule of law, absolutely. This idea that somehow almost a natural law was above all else and we were all beholden to it. And again, that feeds into other constructs because that could allow for a theocracy or an oligarchy or an aristocracy. This idea that some people are chosen to be above others and enforce these rules upon us. Communism. Communism. The other great 19th, 20th century paradigm. Now, when I talk about fascism, communism, and democracy, I'm not ignoring other forms of political theory, but it's simply easier to examine the idea of what constitutes a paradigm of political theory by looking at those dominant factors. So what is it about, let's start with fascism. What is it about fascism that is attractive? Sorry, that, is what? that is attractive. What makes it it's a philosophy strong. that's easy to buy into? It's strong. It is. Strong government is sometimes essential. You may come across the idea sometimes in debates that a strong government is more important than a weak democracy in terms of furthering the aims of a nation state, in terms of nation building, in terms of developing economically in certain hostile conditions. I mean, isn't there a certain argument to say that in Iraq they should reestablish a strong dictatorship to bring things back under control rather than trying to? I think there's certainly an argument to say that Saddam Hussein was possibly the most effective weapon we had against encroaching Islamist terrorism in Iraq because he didn't stand for any of it. And that's evidenced by the fact that when he invaded Kuwait in 1990, the first person to offer to do something about it on behalf of the West was a chap in Afghanistan called Osama bin Laden. And he phoned up the US president, George W. Bush Sr., or George Herbert Walker Bush, and he said, George, this Saddam bloke, do you want me to take him out for you? And George Bush said, you know what? We're not really that interested in getting involved in Arab-Arab conflicts. How times change, ladies and gentlemen. But ultimately, yes, strong uh, leadership can be very, very important, particularly when. When might we look to leaders to be strong rather than democratic? War and crisis. 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 War, economic crisis, political crisis itself. When the state risks dissolving into a state of anarchy. We'll come to anarchy as a system rather than an absence of, of a system later. But in this sense, when we talk of a state of anarchy, we mean a lack of control. That is why, in the 1920s particularly, across Europe, not just in Germany and Italy, but Spain also, there was a very, very quick movement to support certain fascist ideologies, because those countries were suffering, principally economically. Franco's uh, Revolutionary War in 1936 was ultimately successful, partly because of the infighting that occurred uh, on the left in terms of the popular front, and that was very damaging to the left as a whole, but also because a lot of people in Spain were starving, and there just wasn't enough food. And if we consider our own heterodoxy in the modern world, where we talk about the importance of things like rights and freedom and liberty, and then we try to apply that to somebody in Angola or Eritrea who is starving to death. Do you think they prefer food or the right to vote? Which do you think might be more important to the man on the ground? I'd say a full belly comes before the right to vote. Because it's kind of hard to enjoy the right to vote when you're dead. And that's one thing that fascism gives us and makes attractive. The other thing about fascism, and one of the things that makes it a paradigm, is that it is internally consistent. It applies a logic to its own structure that appears to work. 
If you start from certain axiomatic principles, and all political theory must necessarily be based in axiomatic principles, does everybody, everybody understand the term axiom? No. A statement which, which, which requires no proof. We hold these, the, one of the great axiomatic statements, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men. All men are created equal. I think self-evidently all men aren't created <laughs> equal. Axiomatic, A-X-I-O-M-A-T-I-C. So axiomatic principle of fascism is that the role of government is first and foremost to protect its citizens in a physical way. Now you can get into lots of arguments about who is considered a citizen under which system, but I don't think any fascist would ever say that government doesn't have a duty to its people. But they would see that duty as primarily being one of physical strength. One of the things that characterizes almost all theories of states is the idea that whoever is in control, be it a fascist, communist, democratic, autocratic, um, aristocratic government, must maintain a monopoly of violence in order for statehood to be achieved. You cannot allow competing groups within a state to exercise the policing of that state, the militaristic aspects of that state, because that in itself leads to a breakdown of control in the state of anarchy. So the fascist principle rests on the idea that strong government is paramount. That is the most important thing government can be, because that is how it is best able to provide that protection or that provisional element for its citizens. Now, is there anything inherently wrong in the fascist idea? Community before the individual. Community is more important than individual. Okay, let's look at that idea in just a second, that communities might be more important than the individual. What so far have we said about the fascist ideology that makes it inherently individualistic? Is there anything that was said? Not necessarily. We could equally have a very fascist-based communal idea. I can think of a paradigm state that conforms to that right now. Does anybody th know where I'm thinking of? China. Not China, but very close to it. Russia. Not. No. Think of somewhere which we don't usually consider fascist, but maintains an awful lot of control over its citizens. United States. North Korea. No. Singapore, ladies and gentlemen. Really? Singapore. Uh, where they say it's okay to beat people with large sticks if they chew gum, based on the rights of the collective. Mm. But ultimately, they have a construct that government tells people to do things and people obey. And the more coercive government is, the more people will obey. And it works in Singapore. Singapore is essentially a fascist democracy. <laughs> because people are given a free vote and keep choosing the system. So there's nothing inherently exclusive about fascism not allowing a form of democracy. People often get confused by terms like fascism because it's very, very hard to think of fascism without automatically thinking of Nazism or Italian fascism or Francoism. But equally, you could include the government of Pinochet in Chile. You could talk about the military hunters in Argentina and in Brazil. Where else could we talk about fascist government? Suharto's Indonesia is another paradigm example. South Africa. South Africa, the apartheid regime, absolutely. And what do all those places have in common? Strong leader. Strong leader, well, obviously, because that's what makes a fascist a fascist. Also a strong inside-outside definition, who is inside the community is yes. protected and who not. Very clearly delineated who we are and who they are, and linked to that, the fact that they are not liked and are not welcome within. There is, by definition, an exclusory element to the fascist state. Why is that? We can't protect the world. 
right? Like that's you have true. a very strong military and you have to really define like if you're that strong and you want to protect your citizens, protect your citizens from whom? From what? Mm -hmm. Obviously that's gonna involve other individuals. Absolutely. Home. Yeah. Well, I have a question. Does fascism require sort of a constructed other or enemy to That's my point, it does. Okay, so my point is that it does. <coughs> and that goes to the way we feel about ourselves. The best way to convince people that you are doing something for them is to find somebody who is not them and do something else to them. Mm -hmm. That's how you define otherness within a society. All fascist regimes, and it is no coincidence, usually predicate ideas based on race, ethnicity, religion, and in that I will include theocracies like Iran as fascistic, Syria. I will include as fascistic. Saudi Arabia, I will include as fascistic in certain elements of its governance. It is very, very clear that certain members within that society are considered better members of that society. In the Nazi construct, it's the area. For Mussolini, he's not really sure. Because we think maybe the Romans were Aryan and then it's Moorish blood coming from North Africa into Sicily that makes modern-day Italians more olive-skinned and dark-haired. So we're kind of shaky on the ethnicity in Italian fascism. In Francoism, where's the definition? Who is other under Franco's characterization of the society? The leftists. It's purely a political distinction. Now, he uses that to shore up the traditional support of the Catholic Church and of the monarchists in Spain. But the only idea that Franco ever attacks is that the commies are coming to get you. More so than Hitler used anti-communist rhetoric. Franco really had to ramp that up, mainly because that was the main threat to his chances of success, was the Barcelona movement that centered around the philosophies of Mikhail Bakunin and Joseph Pierre Proudhon. You have a question? Yes. According to all those definitions, you have a, an answer. In Venezuela, we have a fascist. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. And, uh, There's nothing to stop left-wing governments from being inherently fascistic. What? There's nothing to stop governments pursuing left-wing policy and still being inherently fascistic. Again, the paradigm for this, and I, I, I feel I have to apologize to Adam because he is from Berlin. <laughs> What's the word Nazi short for? National Socialism. So they were a distinctly nationalist and socialist party. They believed in strong centralized control of the state, which is one element of political theory, and allied it to that being of benefit to specifically the German peoples. And in Hitler's characterization, that meant all German-speaking peoples, whether they reside in Berlin, the Czech Sudetenland, in Austria, in the Polish corridor that led up to Danzig, which was German territory that was taken away by the Treaty of Versailles. But I think he also felt that Alsace and Lorraine were probably unfairly French. Um, <laughs> there were lots of sort of areas where you can find a pocket of German speaking. Hitler ultimately was amazed that Britain opposed him because he saw us as a, a Germanic people. The Anglo Saxons are a Germanic people. Our language comes more from a German than a Latin root. So Hitler wondered why, you know, we didn't turn around and go, good on you, mate, come over here. Britain, I think, is a special case in terms of political theory, and that's what I'm going to talk about at the end. But that gives you an idea that you can define a political paradigm by looking at the similarities, even where that paradigm has occurred, in very, very different environments. <coughs> There's almost nothing that Pinochet's Chile and Suharto's Indonesia have in common, except for the fascistic elements of governance that followed Pinochet and Suharto coming to power. For those of you that are particularly interested and want to read further on this, also explore the relationship between right-wing libertarian economics and fascistic government, brilliantly explained in a book called The Shock Doctrine by Naomi Klein, where she talks about the responsibility of Friedman and the Chicago School and Hayek and the Austria School in deliberately supporting um, autocratic government because it was the best way to force through unpopular reform. That's often why, and this brings me on to the next point quite nicely, that's often why when there is a left-wing revolution, before you ever approach a communist state, you have to go through a period of fascism. 
because the reforms are considered by a large section of the population that didn't support the revolution so unpopular. The only way you can do it is through almost shock tactics. You force through so many reforms, you take away people's right to object, which means, means removing the democratic principle. So in that sense, just as I would say there are elements of Chavez's government that are certainly socialist, there are elements of it that are clearly fascistic. Just as I would characterize Stalin as more of a fascist than a communist. What is it about communism that distinguishes it then from fascism? Well, it can't be nationalistic because communism envisions itself as a global struggle where all people are united and nationalism is your country struggle. Absolutely. When the first communists got together, they called it Comintern, the communist international. It is by definition an internationalist movement. And that's borne out by the idea that the professor of law in Peru has more in common with the professor of law in Norway than he does with the janitor or the road cleaner in Peru. Our experience of the world, and therefore how we form our worldview, tends to be more conditioned, far more conditioned in fact, by our social class, our profession, and our sex, rather than by an artificial construct of nationhood and an accident of birth and geography. What also distinguishes communism from fascism is, and this is where things get a little bit confused in political theory, is that we've never ever in this world had a communist state. Okay? Let's get that one out of the way really quickly. The closest we have come, possibly the former Yugoslavia where we are now sitting under Tito, possibly Albania under Enver Hoxha, where there was genuinely no concept of private property or cars and things like that were communally owned. Now, in order to achieve that stage, you must necessarily go through your period of fascistic government to implement things like land redistribution reforms. Had the ANC in South Africa at the end of the apartheid regime been allowed to implement what they wanted in terms of land redistribution and wealth redistribution to the black population, people would have said they're being just as bad as the Blancos were because it's just swapping sides. It's literally like a game of Othello. You turn all the white counters over to black counters and that's how South African politics works. But ultimately, the ideal of communism is that that transitory period of fascistic government is necessarily short term and leads you to a fairer society. This is what Marx said when he said that revolutionary government was merely a phase and what Bakunin extends on when he talks about the need for the state to wither away completely. Communism in that sense is much closer to anarchy as a system rather than an absence of a system. And what do I mean when I say anarchy as a system? It's an ordering principle. We can put anarchy on the one side and hierarchy on the other side, and then we have two ordering principles. Yes, absolutely. Most people in political theory talk about a state of anarchy as a complete lack of control. Anarchy in the mind of Joseph Pierre Proudhon, who is the father of anarchy, and Mikhail Bakunin, paradigm book to read on anarchy is Citizen and the State by Proudhon, absolutely fantastic work, I recommend it highly, is that eventually human beings will get to the point where they realise that they do not need the state for anything. That through experiment, through trial and error, through trying systems and revolutions and watching them consistently fail, we realise that a free exchange of ideas based on communal use of land, based on communal productivity, is in fact fairer and better for everybody, Bakunin says, including the rich, which I think is fine. He says you might not be as rich, but consider your position as a super rich person in, for example, the US of A, where you might have to live in a gated community with 24-hour private security firms to protect your property because the inequity of society that your system has created means that there are people two miles down the road living in cardboard boxes and starving to death. And McEwenian says you've simply traded your economic liberty for your social liberty on that level. So when we get to this paradigm of communism, it's something quite bizarre to get our heads around given that we have lots of people political theorists equally, who say communism has failed. 
how can something have failed if we've never actually tried it? The USSR, at best, was state capitalism, which is another way of saying what? National socialism? Central control by government defined on this is what's best for my definable group of people? There's very, very little difference between Stalin's Russia and Hitler's Germany, essentially. They both require the definition of the other in order to promote their ideology. They both require that adherence to the nation is paramount. Okay, you can substitute in part of Russia's history the word nation for party, but even under that, Stalin's characterization of the party was as an essentially Russian construct. The party in, for example, Estonia and Lithuania, when they were part of the former Soviet Union, wasn't considered as good as the party in Moscow. So there was an inherently nationalistic element to it, which was rather strange, given that Stalin was from Georgia. I often wonder, if Stalin was still in charge of Russia today, how he would feel about South Ossetia wanting independence. As a Georgian, would that conflict with his ideas of national sovereignty? It's an interesting one. It'd be nice if we could ask him. Fortunately, we can't. But with communism, and this is why it's such an enduring paradigm, it's almost certain that we will never get to try it. Now, why do I say that, and yet I profess to be, in, as an ideal, a pecunist? Well, this is where you need to go to your French political theorists, like Mercuse, who says everything that Marx says is right, except for the fact that the revolution is inevitable because people are just a bit shit. He said, Marx, you're absolutely right that capitalism will produce these major crises and we will recapitalize and we will have another crisis and we will recapitalize and have another crisis. Marx says eventually we'll get to breaking point and the revolution becomes inevitable. This is the idea that the seeds of the revolution are organically sown within the society in which the revolution takes place. Mercu says, lovely thought, but no. No, 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 no. Have you not seen people? They're idiots. They'll just keep on doing this and thinking that somehow, because we recapitalise, it's going to be better this time. And this is what we do. In 1987, when the stock market crashed, we recapitalised. Then when we had the savings and loans crisis in the 90s, we recapitalised. Then in the mid-90s, when it was Europe's turn, we recapitalised. And look what we're doing now. We're launching $700 billion bailouts of investment banks. Because when rich people start to lose money, suddenly it's government's duty to help them. It's funny that when small businesses go to the wall, nobody says, oh, the government must step in and pay these people's mortgages. And yet when bankers lose five million, suddenly the taxpayer's got a duty to bail them out. That's an interesting thing, because all it does is show that Mercuse, so far, is absolutely right in his characterization of how people and political theory relate. But isn't, there a certain, like, isn't that stem from the fact that humans are inherently conservative and they sort of prefer, like, the better the devil you know than the devil you don't. Like, they know capitalism, and it's a safer bet than trying to make a leap. The system's not so bad. On a semantic level, Mercuse would say there's no difference between the term conservative and the term I've used, which is stupid. <laughs> Mercuse says it's people's stupidity that makes them inherently conservative and unwilling to take risks, when we can see that even though the risk might be larger than we've taken in the past, the potential payoff always makes that risk worth taking. Now, I don't want to get too much into probability and black swan theory and why the most unlikely event is, by definition, the most probable to occur. We can save that for another elective later in the week. But what Mercuse says is we will simply not learn from our mistakes because we have both an assumption that we are somehow better than the people who did it last time, and therefore, whatever they got wrong, we won't, even though we do exactly the same, and any amount of systems thinking, and all political theory must somehow involve systems thinking, what does systems thinking teach us? If you keep doing the same things in order, you will end up with the same result. You put the same data in, put it through the same process, you're not going to get a markedly different result. To believe that you will is a form of insanity, clearly. To think, if I type two plus two into a computer enough times, once it will say five. Well, no, it always will say four. And McHugh says we never, we never learn this as human beings. The second reason we never learn this is that as human beings, we rationalize back 
Uh, Camus, Albert Camus also said this. He said, human beings are never rational. We are consistently rationalizing. But we rationalize backwards. History is written after all the events have happened. We decide on what caused those events, and then we look for the evidence that supports that theory. And all the data we come across that doesn't support the theory, we dismiss as irrelevant data. Now, if that history were that predictable, why couldn't we stop things from happening? Because the rationalization only happens after the event. Because as human beings, we suffer from what Mercuse characterizes as corroborative bias. We make an emotional response, then we look for evidence that, on a logical level, corroborates that that emotional response is the right one to have. And that's why communism may never be tried whilst lots of people going around going, wouldn't it be lovely? Almost everybody you talk to, apart from the confirmed sort of free market libertarians, who I think are just a little bit wacky, almost everybody you talk to who's studied political theory says, as an ideology, communism is lovely, but it will never work in practice. Well, it will never work in practice if we never try it. That's truistic on the most basic level. But almost everybody agrees that it's a nice idea, that there's something utopic about people being treated fairly, nobody starving, everybody having a home, a roof over their head, food in their stomach, some form of meaningful employ, whether it be paid or otherwise. Philip. Mm -hmm. Oh, you were just white, okay. Um, about communism, how large does it have to be before it's like when we consider the political system? Because sort of smaller communes have happened. And oh, absolutely. But the, the original commune arts in Paris. But I can think of one country which has several little communist systems, but is in fact a semi-theocratic democracy. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? Kibbutzim in Israel. Possibly the most communist societies on the planet, where everybody does work for everybody else. And you can go to the kibbutzim without being particularly religious. You don't have to be Jewish. Certainly you don't have to be Hasidic in order to be accepted on kibbutzim. But they are run according to, they're not even Marxist. They are purely Bakunins in terms of everybody works the land together. Everybody cooks together. If you are sick, it doesn't matter. You are taken care of. On that level, they work perfectly. And Bakunin says we probably shouldn't try to expand beyond that size because size then becomes the problem. But even they failed and introduced some market reforms, in, for example, to hire managers who get a better pay. So even there it didn't work. I wouldn't necessarily say that they failed. I mean, I think the idea of kibbutzim competing with each other to be the best kibbutz goes against the principle of the kibbutzim. <laughs> and then they have stopped being what they originally were and have become part of this heterodoxy of market forces. I'm now going to go on to this idea of different constructs within paradigms. And this is where we see these certain tensions, this idea that you can be nationalist and socialist at the same time. You can have inherently fascistic government trying to do very left-wing things when we usually characterize fascism as an ideology of the right. Fascism is better characterized not as an ideology, but as a, a management system, if you like. And that's what we do in most countries. We don't vote for ideologies, we vote for a change of CEO. Now the only state in the world that's honest enough about this is Hong Kong, where they don't have a mayor or a president, they actually have a chief executive, that's his title. So you can call it Hong Kong PLC, because they know that their only purpose is as part of a global market. So they are honest enough and say, our head of state in Hong Kong is a, is a chief executive. And that's what most countries deal with. Because we recognize that when we deal in paradigms and ideologies, it becomes very, very difficult to prevent conflicts from happening within those states. Because most ideologies are by their nature exclusive to some degree. So you have different constructs within certain paradigms, like democracies which are more or less control or command economies, Singapore, is very, very focused on control of the population. Or you have democracies that are pure, where the will of the people is paramount. Or you have, like in Britain, like in the US, an idea of representational democracy, where we make a decision once every four or five years, 
and then we abrogate our right to continue making decisions. We don't have everything decided by referendum. Now that's partly on policy grounds, but it's also partly on the idea that pure democracy is not a balancing of constructs within it, it is itself a paradigm. Pure democracy, where if 51% of the people vote to do something, then you do it, has its own problems. What if 51% of the people say it's okay to push homosexuals off cliffs? Does that make it right? If 51% of the people say we should kill all the gingers, does that make it right? If it does, then we legitimise states like apartheid South Africa. Now, you could argue that South Africa wasn't a democracy because the whites were a minority. But I don't think South African apartheid would have been okay if the whites had had enough babies to outnumber the blacks. I don't think that's a fair justification. So the reason most places, and this is why Churchill said, democracy may very well be the worst form of government, apart from everything else we've ever tried, is because a construct of democracy that allows differing constructs within it is possibly the best way we have of balancing competing rights within a society and protecting minority rights from what we call the tyranny of the majority. That's often a great um, quote if you're faced with somebody saying, this is democratic, therefore it's good. Remind them that democratic, therefore it's good, is effectively saying we like to rule by lowest common denominator. We want to appeal to the most base element of all humans because that's what will manifest itself in the popular will. The term we use in England is rule by white van man. That guy who chooses not to engage with the news, who bases his ideas on prejudices rather than on information. Those are the people you can reach very, very easily with stump speeches that are persuasive but aren't necessarily logically thought out. Now, even things like Marxism have their own constructs within them. If somebody says Marxism in a debate, challenge them on which construct they're using. Are they talking about a Leninist construct? Are they talking about a Stalinist construct? Are they talking about a Maoist construct? So, uh, they're all very, very different. The Leninist construct, because of the environment in which Lenin grew up, says we like communism, because we're quite optimistic that people will treat people well, but at the same time we think people are a bit dumb so they need an educated elite to tell them what a good version of communism is. Anybody spot a logical flaw there? <laughs> and Lenin said, and he actually wrote in a private letter to Friedrich Engels, of which I have a facsimile at home, that um, they should never allow the common man to control the revolution, because then it would all go wrong. I find that quite a difficult idea to deal with. And I understand then why Marx, on hearing this, said, this is why we must never let communism fall into the hands of the Russians. Because the way that the Russian society was constructed, he said it wasn't ready for communism. Marx didn't write the manifesto for Moscow. He wrote it for London. Because he saw England, at the end of the 19th century, as the perfect post-industrial society. The one where the workers would have both the ability and the willingness to take over the means of production, which was central to his thesis. Mao, on the other hand, totally rejects Lenin's ideas and says, no, the intellectuals are themselves part of the dominant elite that we are trying to rid ourselves of. Mao takes it to the other extreme and says, you, sir, with the glasses, you look like you've read a few too many books to me, and that spells danger. <laughs> So all the intellectuals and all the university professors in the rebellion in 1946 in China were automatically, whether they had sympathies with the leftist revolution or not, were automatically enemies of the revolution. This reaches its own paradigm in Cambodia with the Khmer insurrection in the 1970s, where Pol Pot did execute people based on whether they needed eyeglasses or not. If their eyesight was poor, it was because they'd read too much and therefore were worthy of death. And because of that, we faced the greatest single political massacre in history, which happened when the Khmer insurrection hit Phnom Penh, the capital of Cambodia, population of which was 850,000 on day one of the Khmer insurrection, 
And on day three of the Khmer insurrection, there were three people officially living in the city. 850,000 to three. That's pretty impressive, even by Guernica standards. It really is. All because they took the logic from the arguments about we must rid ourselves of the old guard and apply it. They almost did their own reductio ad absurdum. They set the clock to year zero because all history had been written by dominant elites and was therefore invalid. So Pol Pot declared that time began on day one of the Khmer insurrection. Quite clearly mad, quite clearly mad, but perfectly logical construct within the paradigm in which he was working. So what are then the differing constructs within democracies? I've already mentioned absolute or pure democracy as being a paradigm of its own. But when we look at things like constitutional or representational democracy, we have very, very differing constructs of that in Eastern and Western countries. As I've already mentioned, Singapore is a democracy which chooses to curb individual freedoms to a very great level, and the society in which it is accepts this. This is partly to do with the construct of rights in East and West, where rights in the East are predicated on the idea of what is good for the collective is automatically good for the individual within that collective. Now in the West, we have a very different construct of rights. If you examine the text of the European Convention on Human Rights, or what is laughably called a universal declaration on human rights by the United Nations, the only thing that's universal about it is that it's universally Western and imperialist. Because it says all rights are based on the individual. That's why we have rights to privacy and self-actualization and freedom of religion and things like that. And the East go, well, no, clearly that's nonsense. That's not how you build a cohesive society. Now, I'm not here to tell you that one of those constructs is better than the other. But for you to be aware of those competing constructs, and that very often, debaters will try to present constructs as already being settled, as there being a heterodoxy of idea, as there very often is when you speak to somebody about communism, they'll say communism has failed. The Cold War has been won. True, the Cold War was won. That doesn't mean that communism has or hasn't failed. Similarly, lots of people will say the UN Declaration on Human Rights and say the Universal Declaration without any hint of irony. There is nothing universal about the construct that it chooses. If we're to look at the Aboriginals in Australia, they have a third completely different construct of rights that is all to do with man's relationship with the land and with the animals around him. And included in that are humans. But humans have no special or divine place over and above kangaroos or koalas or snakes or spiders. The Aboriginal construct of rights is very, very similar in a way to the Native American construct. It's about relationship and how nature is itself symbiotic. When we try to impose certain constructs from one dominant political theory onto another, we create huge problems. When we look at the way the white settlers in North America treated the Native Americans, we didn't think we were doing anything wrong buying their land from them for a few blankets that we'd chosen to infect with smallpox. Because we were like, well, you know, they sold it to us. How can they sell land that they never had a concept of owning to begin with? All the contracts that we drew up saying it's our land now, they didn't understand what it meant to call it our land or their land. Because the land was just land that you lived on and that you worked with. And when the seasons changed, you moved. And diet changed according to season. And hunting practices changed according to season. When we first introduced horses into North America, with the conquistadors in the 16th century, or 17th century. And the Native Americans, who had never had horses, as, or never domesticated animals, used to think it was great fun to go and steal horses from people. Because it was just a game. Because they had no concept of a horse being private property. So the young lads from one group, the Navajo or the Cree, would go and steal the horses of another group. And then the next week, they'd come and steal them back. And it was like children playing hide and seek because they hadn't had these constructs of property. We imposed them upon them and said that all Native Americans are, are becoming horse thieves. They can't be thieves if they don't have a concept of theft. So imposing constructs on people who don't have those constructs leads us to treat those people in very, very different ways. And this is why, for example, 
and this is a little bit about legal constructs, we choose to characterize particularly African peoples, the Native American peoples, as tribes rather than nations. If you listen to the rhetoric of the Native Americans themselves, the Sioux, and I apologize for calling them that, I recognize that that's the colonialist name, I just don't know the name in their language, but the Sioux are a nation of people, they are not a tribe. But when we call something a tribe, it allows us to deny them things like land rights, like rights of self-determination, which we enshrine in other legal constructs. We say everybody has a right to national self-determination, but first you've got to prove you're a nation. And by definition, we're going to call you a tribe. That's nice of us, isn't it? And we do the same all over Africa. We refer to the Hutus and the Tutsis as tribes. We refer to the conflict in Rwanda as tribal. That's because we chose to draw boundaries that put Hutus and Tutsis in the same country because it fulfilled our principle of divide and conquer. So different constructs within paradigms. Are the Hutus and Tutsis the same tribe to begin with? No. They're not tribes, they're nations. Um, okay, but weren't they the same? No, no. Okay. They, their boundary, because they were migratory people, their boundary shifted. Okay. It was only when Western powers, and Belgium particularly, colonised Rwanda, that they drew boundaries that put half of one nation and half of another in the same artificial nation state, because they would then focus on fighting each other, and the white man could take the gold and the land and everything else. You might have guessed I'm not a big fan of the white man generally. <laughs> okay, so what is the purpose then of political theory? Is it to mediate between different groups? to allow them to have competing rights and for us to determine, in some way, which rights are going to triumph? Is it to define who people are, who they see themselves are, systems of governance? Or is it simply to allow us to form a construct of a relationship between state and citizen? Which is it? No, I think it's all three. I think if you are going to allow a concept of nationhood, then you have to allow an idea of self-governance. And included in that has to be the idea that you get to choose what form of government you have. You don't get to force democratic government on people, particularly not the way the US tries to do it in the Middle East, where we force people to have free and fair elections, and if they elect the person we don't want, we say, nice try, You've almost understood how democracy works. Now have another go. And then try, no, no, you're not quite there, are you? You keep electing this guy that says you want to be a socialist state. And that's not right. And that's exactly what um, United Fruit did to destabilize nascent um, national democracies in South America. The CIA helped to undermine them, which brings us back to the hunters in Brazil, in Argentina, Pinochet's Chile. We didn't like the fact that when these people threw off the yoke of colonial oppression, and the same in Africa, South Africa again being a paradigm example of this, the ANC had a very, very leftist agenda when they were in opposition. When they came into power, they were elected on the back of a manifesto that said, we will take all land and redistribute it amongst the black people of South Africa from whom it was stolen. They were elected on that, and the IMF said, hmm, sounds a bit lefty to me. So what we're going to do is, unless you drop that completely from your manifesto and go further and say it was never your intention in the first place, we're going to both cripple you with apartheid era debt and we're going to refuse to bail you out with IMF loans. And when you remove a country's ability to have an economy, they're not going to care very much about rights. As I said, the starving man would rather have food than the vote. When you take that to a state level, what we say to the ANC or to newly nationalist countries in Africa is, you don't get to push a socialist agenda, even though it's the one your people want. So you don't get to export democracy in that way. Self-governance includes and must include a right to choose the form of government, even if you choose to elect a non-democratic form of government. That has to be okay. So then, this idea of systems of government. Yes, political theory is there to talk about best systems of government, as we've already done in the earlier part of this elective where we talked about the paradigms and why representational democracy appears to be 
the best way we have of managing those competing rights and particularly protecting those minority rights from the tyranny of the majority. And lastly, this idea of the relationship between state and citizen. Now, if anybody here has ever heard anything about social contract theory, forget it. It's wrong. Completely and utterly wrong. There is no such thing as a social contract. Rousseau is dead. <laughs> Equally, Hobbes no longer alive and kicking. Hobbes and Rousseau have very different ideas of the social contract. The only thing that Hobbes and Rousseau have in common is that they're both equally wrong. Why is there no social contract? Time and consistency. There's a hand up behind you. There's no place you can go to not be in a social contract. Exactly. You can't opt out. You can't rescind the social contract. And if you can show me my signature on it, I'll give you a million pounds. Because I never opted in. I was born into a state that said, this is our control mechanism. Now I can leave this state and go to another state, but I can't go somewhere where there isn't a state performing some kind of control mechanism. Now we might on some level accept that because of competing rights, we have to have state mediation because otherwise we all dissolve into an inherently fascistic strength is right state of being, and that's probably undesirable. That doesn't mean I have to buy either the Hobbesian or the Rousseauian contract theory idea. Lastly, and it is lastly, this idea of what do left and right now mean? Because they, we no longer have a linear political spectrum where we have left wing, centre ground, right wing. Sorry, for you guys it's the other way around, isn't it? <laughs> no, because you're looking at me, I'm just trying <laughs> Very often in modern political theory, we tend to draw the political spectrum as being more circular and even more spherical in a three-dimensional sense. So that you can have left-wing libertarianism, you can have right-wing libertarianism. I am a libertarian from a social anarchist point of view. I am equally economically libertarian, but only after money has been abolished. <laughs> because economic libertarianism is an inherently right-wing point of view. Because the whole idea of a capitalist system is that strength, in this sense, financial strength, is right. The might is right idea. If I have certain purchasing power within a capitalist construct, I'm going to have far more relative dem democratic power than someone without money. Because I have more choice if I have money. I am not constrained by economic hardship in the choices I make. So libertarianism, when it first evolved as a political philosophy, was firmly on the left of the spectrum. That's the sort of school that Bakunin is coming from. But when we nowadays talk about libertarianism, we're talking about Friedman, Hayek, the Chicago School, the Austria School of Economics. Similarly, when we talk about things like anarchy, when we talk about things like social policy, let's look at Sweden, for example. Is Sweden a socialist country or not? Is it, first of all, is it a democratic country? It's socially democratic, as opposed to liberal de democratic. But liberal also used to be part of the old left wing, because it was the conservatives who were inherently right. -wing. And yet, liberalism in terms of democracy is more right wing than social democracy, which is actually far more conservative. So which is left and which is right? Because even I'm confused and I wrote these notes. If we talk about social democracy as being leftist, we must also accept the idea that the left is inherently conservative rather than progressive and revolutionary. Similarly, if we talk about liberal democracy as being rightist, which it clearly is, then we have to accept the idea that the right is the one that drives for social change. And that seems inherently contradictory. However, if we go back 200 years or even 150 years, who was the most progressive party in the USA 150 years ago? Republicans. Abraham Lincoln was a Republican, people. The guy who took the country into a civil war because he believed that slavery should end. And this is a man who was on record as saying he didn't think blacks should have equal rights. He just didn't think they should be slaves. Now you can make the argument that Abraham Lincoln was making his argument based on pragmatic grounds that he didn't see the benefit for the country as a whole of maintaining the slave system, but that he was still inherently conservative in certain social 
attitudes. But it's quite possible to be liberal in some attitudes and conservative in others without ever feeling a conflict within yourself about being leftist or right. Why do we always assume, for example, that people who are pro-life in a prenatal sense are also the people who will tend to support use of the death penalty in society? They both seem to be inherently conservative positions. Similarly, those who are pro-abortion, no, not pro-abortion, that's the wrong characterization. They don't go around going, we want more abortion. <laughs> but those people who are pro-choice are also the ones who say it's never legitimate for the state to kill. So, and yet, nobody feels any internal conflict by maintaining those two positions. Yet those two positions would seem to stem from entirely different ends of the old political spectrum. So in political theory now, we need to try and redefine some of our terms if we're able to carry on moving the discussion forwards. I think we're just about out of time because I'd like you to have two minutes before the next elective starts. I'm really sorry there isn't time for any questions. Please do come and ask me anything you want over dinner. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Every day to a concert in the nation of the Systems. Which is different.